Hey everyone, uh, I'm excited to be talking to you for a little bit and interacting with all of you over the next uh, couple of days. Uh, many of us are here right now because while we've been actively discussing the importance of forecasting in ecology for decades, in terms of becoming a domain in which active, rigorous forecasting plays a central role, ecology is really still just getting started. And as a result, uh, we often look to other domains where forecasting is more established to understand how to make ecological forecasting more effective. The classic example of this is weather forecasting, which started off as performing worse than the long-term average, but has gradually improved to the point that many of us rely on these forecasts every day. And some of this improvement is driven by improvements in forecasting models, resulting in part from the fact that since early in weather forecasting's history, predictions from different models have been publicly available so that they could be compared to each other and everyone could learn to do better by looking at the approaches being used by the most effective forecasts. And that's an important lesson. But the practice of ecology differs from weather in a lot of important ways. As a field, we're interested in predicting lots of different things, and we work in lots of different places and on lots of different species. We also evaluate models using many different kinds of metrics. And this means that even if large numbers of ecologists start actively working on forecasting, it will still be difficult to understand which kinds of approaches are most effective in general. And as a result, we would have to spend a lot of time learning about how to forecast every time we wanted to make forecasts for a new system. One solution to these kinds of issues is something called a data science competition or challenge. The idea behind these competitions is that the organizers put together a core data set and a set of tests to be performed. Then many groups participate by developing models and making predictions for those tasks. And then the organizers evaluate the performance of the predictions using a consistent set of evaluation methods. This allows the different modeling approaches to be directly compared with one another because the data and evaluation metrics are identical across all of the different approaches. If these competitions are well designed, they can lead to improvements in approaches that can be applied broadly to a core set of problems. One good example of this is image classification and the associated annual ImageNet challenge where teams focus on classifying images into categories. And this is why image search works so well now and we can find cute pictures of, of cats and dogs as often as we need them. But when the competition started about a decade ago, the best model had over a 25% chance that none of its best five guesses was right. which meant that when you searched online for images of cats, you were still pretty likely to get back pictures of dogs or even something cuter instead. But thanks in part to this competition, this classification error rate has dropped quickly uh, over the last 10 years uh, until it was eventually better than even the average human performance. And this is also an example of competitions leading the way forward in terms of methods development because the AlexNet method, the best performer in 2012, is viewed as a major advance that produced a community-wide recognition of the importance of a particular new approach, convolutional neural networks, which then became the foundation for the field moving forward. Now, due to their success in other domains, these kinds of competitions are starting to be used in ecology, generally in areas with a focus on image classification from things like camera traps or community science projects like iNaturalist. 
One example of this kind of competition is one run by a, a team that I'm fortunate to be a part of, where the competition is designed to figure out how to find trees in remote sensing imagery and determine what species each tree belongs to. This work is led by the awesome Sarah Graves and the amazing Sergio Marconi. And the two tasks here, identifying trees and classifying them to species, are already fairly common in remote sensing. But they're done using dozens of different methods, each of which has been developed on different data sets and evaluated using different metrics, and for which implementations are often not even available, so you couldn't test them on your own if you wanted to. And as a result, we don't really know what works and what doesn't, and therefore we don't know what the best starting point is for improving on these methods in the future. So we've been using the National Ecological Observatory Network's fantastic open remote sensing data to help address these problems and getting multiple groups to apply their techniques to figure out which methods work best and under what circumstances. In the first round of this competition, we had around 50 groups sign up to participate and about 10% of those that ended up submitting predictions. These allowed us to compare a range of approaches for species classification, including uh, one that successfully identified tree species uh, for 92% of individual trees, uh, which was better than the previous methods that had been developed locally for the NEON site. Uh, that we used in this study, Ordway Swisher. And we're in the process of running the next round now. Uh, if you don't have enough other things to do, uh, there's a link at the bottom. Uh, and we currently have groups from over 100 different institutions uh, that have signed up to participate. These kinds of competitions have also played an important role in developing forecasting methods. And in particular, uh, the M competitions uh, pull together data from tens of thousands of time series and then challenges uh, forecasters and data scientists to develop methods that can be applied across a, across a wide variety of domains and data types. And the fifth iteration of this competition is also running right now uh, for anyone who's interested. Forecasting competitions in ecology are much more limited, but there is one very nice recent example led by Grant Humphreys from Heather Winch's group, which focused on predicting Antarctic penguin population dynamics. And this work suggested that there was substantial potential for improvement in ecological forecasting based on these competition style approaches with four of the submitted models outperforming the model that the organizers, a highly quantitative team of domain experts, had previously developed. So if you've bought into the idea that there are good reasons to run ecological forecasting competitions, the next question is what makes for successful competitions that will produce useful results? The starting point I think, is to have a task that is common, ideally both within your domain, so that there are lots of domain specialists who will be interested and there will be broad applications of the results, and also more broadly, so that you draw in outside expertise to improve on domain-specific methods. Finding things in images and classifying them is one example of this kind of breadth. And fortunately, so is making forecasts based on observational time series and potentially some covariates. Once you've got a common task, it's important to provide a very precise definition of the task that you want participants to accomplish. This includes detailed descriptions of the input data, the types of predictions to be made, the precise format predictions need to be provided in, and details of exactly how the predictions will be evaluated. And in our experience, doing this well is surprisingly difficult for even moderately complicated tasks. And there's always been a need for further clarification once the competition has been launched. 
The third step is to make it as easy as possible uh, for participants to engage with the data. The easier it is, the more people will participate. This means eliminating the substantial amount of data cleaning and manipulation that goes into most data science work so that participants can jump immediately to the modeling stage. Making the data open also allows for broad participation and makes it easier to share the methods associated with competition entries. The platforms that run data science competitions, platforms like Kaggle, spend a lot of time working with the organizers on both clearly defining the task and simplifying the data to make sure that it is easy to participate. It's also often important to provide some type of reward to encourage people to participate in the competition. Most competition platforms offer monetary rewards of some kind to the winning entries. And this is done for some science-focused competitions, but it's often not easy to come up with prize money. So the approach that we took in our competition uh, was to invite everyone to who participates to write a short paper describing the methods and results of their submissions so that their work can receive some credit through the traditional academic reward structure. And these papers were published as a collection alongside the main paper about the competition. And this is a, a common approach in, approach in data science competitions in computer science. Some other competitions, uh, instead of a, a collection of packages, also invite people who produce the best predictions uh, to be co-authors on the single paper describing the competition as a whole. Finally, no matter how hard you work on creating a clearly defined task and easy to use data, there will always still be some confusion. So it's important to have a platform, even if it's just an email address, that allows participants to ask questions and get help as they work on the competition. My last set of thoughts relates to how we build and grow competitions to ensure that we learn as much as possible from them and therefore advance science most rapidly. To allow rapidly building on the best solutions from a competition, as much of the participant work as possible should be openly available. All of the participants in the first round of our competition posted their code under open source licenses, and this has allowed us to ensemble top performing methods for species classification in ongoing applications. This has also been a major emphasis of the M series forecasting competitions. We should also leverage competitions to push the field forward beyond potentially where it is right now. Competitions should of course maintain a theme over time, but shift the challenges and expectations to level up the field. For example, the M competitions started with a focus only on point estimates for forecasting, but later added a focus on uncertainty and later still added increasingly complex time series. In the first round of our remote sensing competition, we focused on only making predictions at a single site. Now in the current round, we're focusing on transferability by pushing participants to develop methods that work across different forest types and can make predictions in a forest that they have no training data for. And finally, I think it's important that we emphasize that these are opportunities to challenge ourselves and our fields and collaborate with our colleagues to learn how to make ecological prediction and forecasting more effective. We should view these as competitions among methods, not among scientists. And remember that the outcome of a successful competition is a win for all of us because it advances science and makes our future work better. Thanks.